it's so hard. It is so hard. It's just so hard. Lon Brower, can you help me become a better painter faster? Well, I don't know if I can do you, but I can get everybody else probably. <laughs> um, but I, and I've got, a, I've got an exercise that I've been doing with my students, and I use it myself, actually. And uh, within an hour's time, you can uh, really pick up some things that uh, I think would be very helpful and move you right along the, along the journey. So you're Personally, saying that you're saying that within one hour, you're going to make me a better painter. If they watch today, one hour, we're going to make, you're going to make me a better painter. Yeah, I think so. I think so. This is a, this is a, a this is an exercise. This is not making paintings, but it is learning how to paint. And that's what we need to do. Right. Well, let's jump right into it. Let's okay. do it. All right. Well, tell you what, let me, uh, I'm going to shift over to my palette. Okay. Lon Brower is here and he's shifting over and he's an incredible painter. You would love the abstract nature of his work. He wins awards everywhere he goes. Uh, we have some of his paintings in our personal collection. Uh, he's an incredible artist and you're going to learn a lot from him today. So hang in there. This is going to be good. All right, Lon, what have you got? Well, uh, right now, this, here's, I've got my palette. This is the image we're going we're gonna to be working from today. What I'm going to do is... I'm going to take this image, which is a fairly simple thing. Uh, it looks a little complicated, but it's really not. And I'm going to show you the mechanics of how I work through this. But um, uh, the other thing that uh, I want to be talking about is how it is very beneficial for us to work, uh, to do things over and over again in a repetitive manner. And uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to demonstrate this thing twice, maybe three times if we have time to do it. And then at the end, we're going to have something to compare to. Um, think about things that you, that you do daily, whether you get up in the morning and you brush your teeth, uh, you get dressed and you uh, put your shoes on, you tie your shoes, you make coffee, you get in the car and you drive. All these things we don't have to think about. And I want painting to be the same way. And I think this exercise, when I show it to you, and if you go through it yourself, you're going to see that you're going to get a familiarity with a particular image rather than shotgunning and, and doing all these different subjects, uh, you're going to have, you're going to know this image so well that you can do it in your sleep. So okay. So we're, we're going to learn about how to paint in your sleep. This is going to be really great. Let's yeah, get the show started. <laughs> it's Art School Live with Eric Rose. Now, here's your host. Eric Rose. The incredible Lon Brower is going to show us today how to make better paintings faster. And this exercise is going to knock your socks off. I've seen him do it. That's why he's here on the show. He's going to blow you away today. I'm Eric Rhodes from Plen Air Magazine, and we are on every weekday at 12 noon. If you're new, welcome. You can subscribe to this program just by simply going to YouTube and hitting the subscribe button, all right? And, and that's, of course, you have to find Art School Live before you do that. So search Art School Live. And then also, if you give a follow, that would be really terrific. Okay, we're going to get right to Lon Brower, and he's going to teach you how to be a better painter in one hour or less. You need to pay close attention. Okay, Lon, take it away. All right, well, let's set some house rules first. I'm going to talk about what, what palette I'm going to use and what tools I'm going to be using. This is our image. And if you look at it, it's black and white and red all over. You remember the old joke we used to hear when we were kids? I mean, I yeah. heard, you know, I heard black and what's black and white and red all over. Well, it's a newspaper. I heard that when I was a seven-year-old, and I thought that was the funniest thing ever. Um, this image, because of the colors, is just crying Zorn palette. So I'm going to be working with a Zorn palette. I'm going to okay, would you explain what a Zorn palette is to everybody? You bet I will. Because it's something I didn't even know and so really not too recently. And I've been using this uh, myself. Let's let's get into the nuts and bolts of it. Um, this first row up on top is what's considered a traditional Zorn palette. And now uh, it's called a Zorn palette because it's named after Anders Zorn. It was a Swedish painter right around the turn of the uh, late uh, 19th century, early 20th century. He was a contemporary of Sargent and Soroya. And he did a lot of portraiture work. And traditionally, it is known as a, it's an ivory black. We've got a, um, a yellow ochre, a cadmium red, and a titanium white. And with those four colors, you can mix so many different varieties of skin tones uh, and get uh, 
And if you look at a lot of Zorn paintings, you see that uh, he's able to utilize just those four colors and mix up. Um, uh, I, I got to tell you something. I got to tell you something, Lon. Um, I was just over at the Zorn House and Museum. I spent two days there with the director. That, that was fantastic. Movie. And uh, he said to me, first off, he took me through uh, the museum, and then we went to an area of storage, and there was Zorn's palette. I said, can I actually pick that up? He said, yeah, if you put the white gloves on, this is not part of the normal tour. And so here I am, I'm putting the white gloves on and I'm holding Zorn's four color palette, which was yeah. pretty cool. And then he said, but Zorn really didn't use the four color palette much. He used it as his, his promotional thing. He wanted everybody to think he used four. He said he used more than four, probably more close to what you're doing with the modified Zorn. You want to tell us about that? Yeah, the Montefiore Zorn, uh, the Zorn palette, the Zorn palette is a great exercise to, to go through and use to understand value because the range of colors are just not there. Um, so what I've gone is, but I want to take the Zorn palette and take it out and, and do plein air with it. Well, obviously with, the, you know, with a yellow, if yellow ochre is all you got, you're not going to be able to get a wide range of greens and we always need greens. So what I've done is I've come up with this, what I call a modified Zorn. So I'm still working with black, yellow, red, and white, but now I've got two yellows and two reds to work with. This is a uh, lemon yellow, and this is a Indian yellow, and then I've got the cad red, and then I've got uh, a lizard and crimson here, which is showing up quite and why, well. And why do you feel the need for those other, other colors? It still stays, well, it just gives me more range. Um, so that, uh, you know, you have the combination of these four up here that you can mix, but by adding a couple more yellows, you've got a cool yellow and a warm yellow, and you've got a, a basically a warm red and a cool red. So we get a little bit of temperature but variation. Interestingly, you didn't put a blue on there. No, well, that's not a Zorn palette. And so what you have to do, so the blue that you're going to be using is you're going to mix a white, uh, your titanium white, which is cool, and you're going to mix it with an ivory black, which is also cool, and you're getting a cool gray. And that cool gray has to work as your blue. Okay. And uh, I think of this sort of like a, a, a color diet. Uh, you, there's a lot. It's like eating cauliflower, you know, like a, a low-carb diet, and all you've got is cauliflower, and you have to figure out how many different ways can you eat cauliflower. <laughs> at the end of a month, somebody says, all right, you've been good. Now you can have some pizza. And that is the blue that you would add to this palette. Once you've got comfortable with this, then you add some blue and things will just sing. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a self-imposed limitation. I think, it's, I think it's a valuable, valuable thing to work with. So uh, we're going to be working with this modified Zorn. Now, what I have on my actual palette, get rid of, we don't need him anymore. Uh, we've got the ivory black. I'm just going to use this one yellow because of the, the subject matter we, we're working with. I think just one yellow. And then I've got, the, this is the uh, lemon yellow. I've got a cad red, titanium white. Most of everything that we're going to be doing is going to be with these four. Over here in a corner, I've got some alizarin because I can mix up, when I mix up black, in fact, I'm going to show you what I do. I'm going to take some black and let me get my paper towel here. Nobody can paint without paper towels. But if I mix this yellow with black, I can get a pretty nice green. And then if I take black and put it over here, do we see that? I'll tell you what, that's got a little bit of a glare. Let's put it here. And let's put some of this red in here. It's going to give me sort of a dark purple. Or a brick red might be a little bit more appropriate. What I want to do is lay that out. So that's given me, now it's already given me, now I've gotten two extra colors. That brick red is not a whole lot different than the uh, alizarin, except the alizarin has a little bit more chroma to it. So I might want to use, that's why I've got the alizarin on here. I think I might end up using that. In fact, you know what, I'm going to take that. I'm going to put it right here. That way we know where it is. So what I'm going to do with that, oh, the other thing I'm going to need, I know I'm going to need, is an orange. And if I do that with, mix this yellow and this red, again, we've got a glare, so I'm going to take this and I'm going to put it. We can see it. See it. You see it there? There we go. So that's going to give me an orange. So this is going to give me more of an orange from here. 
Uh, and I think that's going to give me probably the range that I need for this particular painting. Uh, before we get too far beyond that, I'm going to show you, I'm using two brushes, this one and this one. And I think that's all I, I'll need. That's usually what I use when I go out in the field. Uh, I take a pile of brushes, but these are the only two I ever use. This one's about an inch and a quarter. This one's a half inch brush. And I can do everything I think with that. I often, I often talk about using a two inch brush which is, uh, uh, you know, I advocate using a large brush, the largest brush you can. I don't think we need a two inch brush for this one. I think this inch and a quarter inch, inch brush will, will work. This is a Rosemary, this is a Princeton, um, very comparable uh, brushes. I really like them both. And uh, so we'll be using that. And the other thing I'll be using is this palette knife. This is the knife that I like to use. Let me see the shape of it. Um, I use this for mixing and I also use it for, for painting when I, when I use a brush in a painting. Um, I also advocate that um, I like to mix my piles ahead of time as opposed to mixing my paints with a brush. I, mean, I know a lot of people do it that way and that may be something that's comfortable for you, but I find I can keep my colors cleaner if I mix them with, with a palette knife. Uh, now, as, having said that, when I get into this, I will be picking things up with a brush and, and you won't see it, but I will pick up some of this and pick up some of this and mix it together. So let's, uh, I'm going to change cameras and let's see here. We're going to go up, get on up to where we're going to be working. I just love having extra cameras. There we go. How's that look? Yeah, I like it. All right. So, uh, you know, one thing I want to talk about is this idea of, of repetition. I found during COVID, uh, and like everybody else, we were stuck in studio. And I started looking at my paintings. And I was thinking, you know, these are not bad. I had piles and piles of not bad paintings, uh, which I, you know, considered, well, yes, they're not bad, but they're kind of mediocre. What are they missing? And when I would lay up one right after another, uh, you know, I'd lay them side by side. They were all different subject matters, and I was not able to compare one to another. So kind of another another title for this um, this talk today would be, called, we could call it comparing apples to apples, uh, because what I want to do is I'm going to paint this thing. I'm going to paint this image over here. This is a 12 by 12 panel, campus panel. I'm going to paint it over here, and then I'm going to paint it again, and I'm going to paint it a third time if I can, and then we're going to be able to lay the three up, and then we can look at it and see there must be a gem in there somewhere, and we can actually then look at what are our strengths, what are our weaknesses, and we can do it very quickly. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and start by drawing this thin. I'm using a brush. You can use a pencil to draw in your to draw in your subject, but I would recommend this is oil paint, by the way. I know you've had a lot of watercolors on these days. Which is I have a lot of everything. You just got to catch me at the right time. That's right. But this is oil paint. And you can do this with a pencil. But I think it's valuable to go ahead and start learning to draw with a brush. Because after all, that's, uh, that's you're learning brush work. And that's part of this exercise, too. Not only um, uh, the, the repetition thing, but it's also about using brush. One of the things that I have problems with uh, that I notice that my students have problems with, and I do too, is that there's two things, basic, basic things that everybody wants to skip, and it's drawing and it's brushwork. You know, I, you know, composition is good and, and value is important and color theory is important, but if you can't draw, if you're strong, if your drawing skills aren't strong, and if you're... Um, uh, I lost my train of thought. If your drawing skills aren't aren't strong, and and your brushwork isn't strong, then uh, you're going to run into you're going to run into problems. And no matter how much paint you throw on there, uh, it's you're still going to be frustrated. So this is a good exercise for finding out what your strengths are, like I said before, and what we can do to make them stronger and better. I want you guys to pay attention to how Lon was holding that brush. Yeah. I, a lot of times I hold a brush a lot of different ways. Sometimes if I want to, you know, sometimes I go out here. A lot of times I'm here. Sometimes I'll do this. But if, but for what I'm doing, I most of everything I'll hold it this right. direction. So. Right. And tell people why you do that. 
why do I do that? It's <laughs> it really, everybody has a different way of holding brushes. Like everybody has a different way of holding a pencil. Um, and how you hold a brush is going to determine how you make marks and how you put the paint on. And I think it's one of the things that you want to experiment with. Find your thing. If if doing this, if you do this, you're going to, like a pencil, you're going to get caught up in detail and you're going to noodle things to death. Whereas if you do this, you have much more freedom and you're not using just your hand, you're using your whole arm. If you saw me from a distance, you'd see that I'm using, I'm standing, I'm standing about two feet away from, three feet away maybe from the, from this canvas. So I've got full range of my shoulder. And I think it's really valuable to keep things so things can stay loose. Now, one thing I want to say is about this is if you're doing this exercise and you're just starting out, you're probably having to learn a whole lot of things that you're not comfortable, that don't feel comfortable. If you can get this far and your drawing isn't feeling real strong, then stop with this and set this aside and get yourself another panel and do it again. And do do just the drawing. Don't take it any further. And then step, throw this aside and then do it again. And by doing that, say, six times, you're going to get much more comfortable. Your first drawing may be bad. Your second drawing may be better, but not a lot better. Your third one will get better yet. And you'll get better as you go along. Again, think about tying your shoes or throwing, uh, shooting free throws. I mean, not everybody's played basketball, but we understand the concept. When you want to practice free throws, you stand there and throw and throw and throw. You oh, or super another good. another way to think about it is with music. Eric, when you play uh, you play a new tune on your guitar, I'm sure that you practice that same tune over and over and over again. I practice one or two notes at a time. There you over go. and over again, and then I practice the next two over and over again, and then so I combine the the four. You want to get a familiarity, a comfort of uh, just a comfortable quality about it, right? So that then you can move on. You, we don't want to be, we want to get past that point where we don't, we start a painting, we don't even know, uh, we don't know what the first thing step is. The well, first step on this, once you do this a few times, your first step is, okay, I pick up this brush and I use this dark, this red black mixture or whatever color you decide to use. All right, let's take it to the next step. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put in these stripes. Now, the stripes are kind of in this angle, so I'm just going to uh, transfer that over. I'm not really concerned about the exact uh, position of these stripes because the stripes are not what's important in this painting. The important thing in this painting is the apples. So we just come across here, and if I'm going to go here, I need to come down here and keep the same angle. And then same way with this one, we'll come here. And if that one is here, maybe it's here. And then I can just fill them out. I'm not even looking at the photo now. I just want them to be about the same size. And then this side, then here, I'm going to start here. We're going to go at this other angle. It's this angle. And we're going to make them stripes about the same size. And I'm going to tell you about something else. As soon as I get that in. Now. If you, again, if you're new to this and you got past the apples and the one stripe going across here and everything looked good, go to this step. And if you, you know, you can get this step, then we can move on to putting paint on, put color on. Um, if not, then that tells you where you are in the scheme of things. You can say, okay, until I can get this figured out, I don't want to move on because you're throwing, throwing paint on this. If your drawing is not strong or you're strong, your drawing is got problems of any kind, throwing paint on it is not going to fix it. Uh, so we want to take one step at a time. So this is really this is really good for people who are just starting out and to say, well, you know, my drawing skills are very strong. I get it. So then with the apple, what we want to do, so let's take it to the next step. An apple is a sphere. We want to start seeing an apple in terms of planes and it's probably a lot bigger discussion than we want to get into. So if, you know, if you're starting out and you're brand new to this, talking about planes might be a little bit, uh, that's a discussion probably for another day. But an apple, because it's a sphere, just you could look at it just like you would a pumpkin. It doesn't have the indentations, but there is these what we call cross contours. 
And what cross contours are doing is that if you were drawing magic marker on this apple, you could take it and just come in and travel around the apple. And by understanding that, then you will understand how to put the paint on the apple. Again, this might be something that, you know, at each one of these levels that we're working at, uh, you're going you're gonna to see what, where you stand in the scheme of things. And then once you master that, you move on to the next thing. Um, let's hold it right. I did this with sort of this mainframe. Uh, it kind of shows you the idea. Uh, just kind of reinforces that idea. That's a good idea to do that with a photograph, don't you think? Just to, to I think it is. And I, you know, it's one of the reasons, you know, just real quick. And we talk about photographs and how, you know, and I've heard you say this oftentimes, and I think it's true, is that if photographs lie. Yes, but they are a good tool, particularly if you're learning. If you're on the early end, early end of it, uh, you're just starting out this painting journey. Uh, working from photo reference is can be valuable. I think you need to find a balance, of course, of working with from life and also working from something that's not going to move. It's you know it's set set in stone, and you can walk away from it and you can come back to it. I think there's something valuable about that. All right, so we're assuming that we're in good shape right now. What I'm going to do is, and I'm going to do this. This is sort of an intuitive thing for me. First thing I got to do is I got to figure out. I want to make sure that I don't get confused on my stripes. <laughs> you know, you're just I, adding more confusion. Well, if I don't mark these out, I will get things going in all kinds of crazy directions. So now I'm working with a bigger brush. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to fill this in. You might recognize this drawing is almost like paint by number or coloring books. Remember coloring books when we were kids? Sure do. Dark lines and you just fill it in. The thing that's nice about this image, and I shot it, and I, this is my image, and I shot this thing intentionally to have a simple yet complex background. I wanted simple shapes that you could draw them. Once you drew them out, then you just fill them in. You know, Eric, at the end of this, I don't know if you either you can do it or I can do it, but this image, I this is my image, and uh, I'd be more than happy to make it available for anybody who wants to use it. Well, it's very generous. Thank you. We'll figure that out. The only thing I ask is if you make a painting and then you sell it for $20,000, give you a half. This image, don't tell me about it because I will not be happy. <laughs> You know, you you were a professional photographer for most of your life, and, yes, and that would be a good thing to address. You know, a lot of people will just pull images off of the internet, and they're using copyrighted images. What's your thought on that? Uh, don't do it. Uh, well, uh, you know, okay, now I, I say that. <laughs> if you're doing it for learning purposes, uh, go for it. I don't think that's a problem. In fact, I know it's not a problem. In fact, I'm, I'm working on one right now in the studio. I'm working out some things, some uh, particular issues uh it's got copyright marks all over it uh, but i won't sell it so uh you know for, for that purpose i think the internet is great for finding images uh and if you do copy somebody else's work at least acknowledge that you know you well, I think af I th after lon brower yeah i th i think so um uh you know if you're getting into something you're going to make and then you're going to sell um if you can have your own image, I think you're going to be a lot better off. It's going to be safer for you. So, uh, but you know, if we're in the learning process, you can do just about anything you want. You know, we didn't have that available to us, you know, even 20 years ago. And what I'm doing is I'm laying this white in. And what I'm trying to do, and you'll notice I'm going perpendicular to this. Whenever there, whenever I have a column like this, let's say a telephone pole or a tree or or an arm or a leg i typically want to go perpendicular to it there's no contour in these stripes per se but it's just easier for me to paint now you see how it's going to pick up some black don't worry about it too much just want to lay it in 
Now, the one thing that I want to, the one thing I want to recommend is you take this image and paint it, let's say paint it six times, one right after the other. Now, one of several of you out there are going to say, I can't paint. That's going to take me an hour to paint that. I get it. So it says, so you just take six, six hours. Six paintings at an hour piece at six hours. I, I, you know, I, I can do the math on that. I don't have that kind of time either. So what I want you to do is set yourself a time limit of 15 minutes. That way, if you do that, you can do four in an hour. Now you're going to say to me, yeah, Lon, but uh, I just told you it's going to take me an hour. I know. When that 15 minutes is up, wherever you are. Stop. Stop. Put it aside. And then number two, you're going to get just a little farther down the road. And then number three, you're going to get a little farther yet. And then number four, you're going to get pretty pretty quick. You might even be able to complete it in 15 minutes. And if you don't, just keep going. It's all right. Because the, the you're going to get at least that first step, that first draw, the first march you make in a drawing, those are the things that you're going to be repeating. That you we will repeat that each time. Then you probably will get as far as the black stripes. You will repeat that. So then you'll have those to compare to. You'll have four of those. Now maybe get the white stripes in. Now you have those to compare. When you get to the apples, you may not get very far with that. But one apple, your first painting, the apples may be only started. By the fourth one, you're going to have something that's got some some uh, meat to it. Um, I'm going to do the apple. I did the apples last because um, they're red, and uh, if I put the red on first, and then I put that try to put that white on. I'm going to pick up some of that red. And every, if you've ever worked with any kind of red, you know how intense it can be, and it will get all over, and you'll end up with pink stripes. There's no way to keep around that. So what I'm going to do is I'm just picking up straight cad red, which is kind of an orange anyway. And I'm just going to lay this in. And you see how I travel around the apple. Now, this paint is rather dry. I'm working with, uh, I like Windsor and Newton Winton paints uh, because I like their dryness. And it is a student grade paint, but it's got just the, it's got the chroma that I need. And uh, it's very consistent, so not I'm not uh, I'm not a salesman for them, but I do like their paint. So, so I lay that on. Now I'm going to pick up this uh, this mixture of black and red, and I'm going to run that underneath on the dark side, and you'll start to see how. And then see how I'm working with also working with cross contour coming into the center of that. This is getting rather dark, but. We'll lighten up here in a minute. On the dark side. Now, this particular image you see right in here, you'll see these reflections off the stripes. I'm not going to worry about that in this one. We'll, we'll play with that in the next one. Yeah, we're doing well on time. So now I'm going to pick up, go back to the CAD red, and let's see if we can brighten this up a little bit. I'm not using any medium, so this paint is pretty stiff. Come in here, and then come in here. Now it's a little more red, more of a cool red because of that black that's in there. So what I'm going to do is, if I can find my mix, I'm going to, I've got that, that orange that I showed you on the palette before. I'm going to make it, put a little bit more yellow into it, and it's a little bit more orange. And see what we can do with that. Actually, let's take. If you guys just joined, uh, Lon Brower is on painting in oil. He's showing uh, a way that you can become a better painter in one hour by repeating the same exercise over and over again. But he's going to do it differently the second time. So hang in there. He's using a relatively limited palette. Now you were you, you were asking earlier, uh, Eric, about holding the brush, and I'm still holding it this way. By doing that, I can drag wet paint over top of red, uh, wet paint, and I can come in here, across here, across the top of the, and then I can come in here and pull out of the center of the apple. A little bit more red on here. Let's just go ahead and lay some red on there. If I was not talking and working quickly. 
I do, I've done this exercise quite a number of times and I've, with this particular image, but I've also done it with other images. And every time you revisit an image once or twice or three times, uh, you're going to see new things that you didn't see the first go around. Okay, now All right. Well, you better get cranking here. You're at the halfway point. I know. Next, one be a, next one's next one's going to be a. It's all the talking. I know it's all the talking. All the talking. I'll put that in there. I'm going to take this. Let's hit this smaller brush. Let's uh, let's redefine this. Let's come back in and draw back in here again, holding the brush like so. You can come in, reestablish that drawing. those contours and I can take pick up some more yellow let's put that in here there comes a time when you get too much paint so what we can do then is scrape through here and not only am I taking paint off but I'm blending paint you see that kind of wants to screen now now it's a little thinner. Now I can take come back in with some of this orange, or actually a little bit of this green yellow, and I can throw that on here like so. We have a question from Kim Albright, which says, is there a benefit to paint six images in one sitting or with time in between? Uh, I would think that it's probably better to keep them one right after another because it's fresh in your head. Um, I think if you have to do one a day and you do it, over a six day period, you're still gonna get benefit, but probably not quite the same. Uh, there's something about, it's a little bit like exercise. You go to the gym, you don't just lift one weight one way, one time. You need to do multiples, and uh, that's when you start seeing some, some benefit from it. So, okay, let's put those highlights back in. Here, here, and here, here. Now, the thing that, that you're gonna learn from this is this a good painting? Probably not. Uh, but the thing that you're going to learn from this is is working with a brush, and you're going to learn brush work. And if you learn brush work, you're way ahead of the game uh, because uh, you know you, we often see really nice paintings. The composition's great, the color's great, everything's great, but there's a timidity in the brush work. And how do you learn that? You learn it from doing it, of course. So I'm going to call that. Well, you know what I'm going to do? And then White's got picked up some paint. I'm going to go ahead and throw in a little bit more white on here. I like heavy paint. It's not everybody's cup of tea, but I like the way it looks. And there, see that one got a little bit. Well, it's all right. I'm going to say we, if you get, if you get, you know, you start getting some streaks in here and you start picking up some color that you don't want, that's when you get your knife out and just take it, take it off. Put that on. All right, let's move on to the next one. I agree. All right. I'll beat this one to death. Okay, so what we're going to do, uh, while Lon is getting the next one ready, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, we've got people watching from all over the world today. Welcome to Art School Live. We're here every weekday at 12 noon. And we would hope that you guys would subscribe to this program. Just go to YouTube and hit the subscribe button. That helps you, but it also helps us. So we'd appreciate it. Thank you so much for doing that. Our guest today is Lon Brower, and he's teaching you how to become a better painter faster by doing multiple paintings of the same thing, but different each time. You're going to learn about that the second time around. Lon is going to be teaching at the Plen Air Convention coming up uh, May 20th through 24th in Cherokee, North Carolina, which is near Asheville. And uh, the price goes up on Valentine's Day. And so why bother uh, signing up after, right? We, we'll get several hundred people who are going to try to sign up at the last minute, only to find out that there aren't very many seats left, and so you need to get in there and get that done. Uh, Lon has uh, an incredible video out, actually. He's got some more on the way, but he's got this one called Abstract Figure Painting, and it is really terrific. If you want to get these uh, loose, goosey, abstracty, wonderful pieces this one's a really good one to do. Lon Brower, and you can find that at PaintTube.tv. PaintTube is where we have over 600 art instruction courses professionally produced, super high quality, great close-ups, uh, so much better than watching a Zoom. And just go to PaintTube.tv, all right? Now, I should also mention uh, that we have a big thing coming up in early March, 
It's called Plein Air Live, and it's going to be really cool. It has made the difference in my world. I get invigorated. Today was just fantastic. I love it. It's just brilliant. I mark it off on my calendar. It was amazing. I need the community. I always wanted to go to art school. I feel like this could be it. The amount of value that is delivered is incomparable. When I did your first plein air live, I was only breaking into plein air and that just opened up my world. Every day I say, this is the best day. And again, it's another best day. <laughs> I'm taking notes, I'm watching what people are doing. I really am very grateful for the opportunity to just look over the shoulders of these great artists. It has taught me not only better plein air, it has made me a better studio painter as well. You know, the lineup is just so amazing. Thank you for introducing all these wonderful new artists to me. Everyone you have on here is fabulous. You learn something from every single teacher every single time, and it's just brilliant. This has made the last three years really bearable. Somebody like me really can't get to a convention. You know, this is really special. I need people to paint with, even though we're not all physically together. But then the relationships that are formed, I think that's what's really long lasting. It's just really fun to, to see people that you've you become friends with, you know, throughout the years. There's always something to learn, no matter how many years you've been painting or if, if you're a very beginner. It has exceeded my expectations and I've already signed up for next year. This is my second year and I definitely signed up for next year. This is my fifth live event. I was so happy. I went for it. You know, this is really special. All right, our guest, Lon Brower, is back. Lon's going to do it one more time. What are you going to do differently this time, Lon? Well, I don't know. What shall we do differently? You got any ideas? You want me well, let's to remove the stripes. Do what? Take the stripes out. Take the stripes out. Okay, well, we can do that. That'll be even quicker and simpler. So let's do this. I don't really need that. No, I think about it. I've done this so many times. I can do it in my sleep. But... Uh, which is what we want, right? I don't think you sleep. You're like always painting. Yeah, yeah I guess. Well, you know how if you do this enough, you do it a lot, you kind of get it in your head. And you know, I always say that, you know, I tell my students, if you go to bed at night and you close your eyes and you're seeing brush marks, you're doing it right. Now this, uh, when I photograph this image, I uh, can't, it's on camera flash, essentially. Um, there's no, there's no cast shadow. I can create that, but uh, we're gonna, we'll see what happens. Let's just see what happens here. I'm going to go ahead and just do this. Again, thinking of contour. I'm going to add just a little bit of mineral spirits to this so that it covers a little better. You know, normally I don't work on, uh, this is a canvas board. I don't normally work on canvas board. Uh, I typically work on uh, birch plywood, and it has a smoother surface. Um, kind of liking this, though. I think when I go down to, I'm going to go down to Texas at the end of the week, and I think I'll, I might take some of these panels with me. I kind of like that. You're allowed. You know what? Yeah. I said you're allowed. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. There's something, the kind of work that I do, uh, I like, you know, I look at a lot of the Impressionist work, and uh, a lot of the paintings that were done in France in 1880s, you get this kind of look to it where it's just, it almost has a sketch look. There's a lot of bare canvas. There's something about that that I find very appealing. Um, do you know the term a bouche? 
a bosch it looks like a bosch, a bosch. You, know, you know the term yeah it refers to a sketch or uh, an early uh, preliminary drawing and one of the one of the uh, the salon people that uh, you know hated the hated the impressionists and they said well it's just an impression but they were calling they, they referred to their their paintings as a bush and a bush so it's especially appropriate when you're painting a bush <laughs> a bush yes sketch it in and be done with it so i right, can you guys tell us where you're watching from our guest today is lon brower we're learning how to paint better paintings in one hour or less by repeating uh, and trying it a little differently each time. Now, uh, again, this is incredibly important. Uh, and it takes a little while to learn, but understand the contour of this. It's, it's a sphere. Uh, well, the first time you kind of have to figure it out. The second time you, you kind of know the mistakes you made the first time. You're going to have you're going to have something yes that's right and when you compare and that you know the other value of this whole exercise is now you're going to have something to compare to now in that last one i did the dark shadow on the shadow side of the apple i did with that mixture of um, red and black and it works but now i'm using a lizard and crimson you can and, and I can't see it here unless i compare it to the other one but it's got so much more chroma I'm doing the same thing I did with that black and red mixture, but here now I'm using something that's got a little bit more punch to it. I'm going to take this and come in here, pull out of that center. I don't know what you call it, the stem. I guess it's the stem hole. I don't know what you call it. You should know that. Uh, let's just put the, in the photo, the stem's not there, but let's just go ahead and put it in there just so we kind of know which direction it's going. Like so. Now it looks like cherries. They do look like cherries because they're so round. Okay, now I'm going to pick up just going to pick up some white and I'm going to just lay it in there. Now, see, I had it right the first time, then I went over it again and I screwed it up. Uh, By the way, another thing you guys can do is somebody commented. Jenny said he must have stacks of panels. You know, you guys can. There's a thing called oil paper. Yes. And you can, that's a great way to learn because you're not burning through a lot of canvas and panels. That's, that's exactly right. Or you know what you can, and I do this, uh, I paint on cardboard, just cardboard, cardboard. uh, you know, get some gesso or some white paint, uh, white, uh, house paint and, and paint those things. So you have a surface to paint on. I have uh, paintings done by Russian masters on cardboard because they had nothing. That's right. Paint. Well, one of my favorites is, uh, Jamie Wyeth and, uh, you know, he paints on cardboard. Okay. Hey, let's move on to the next one. Okay. One more time. Here we're we gonna, go. We're going to show all these when we're done. Now, what if, you know, somebody's going to say, well, what if I put, what if I painted that with a, with a, a palette knife? Well, that would be remarkable. Hey, what if you painted that with a palette knife? <laughs> the thing to keep in mind though, is if you do it once, don't just do it once. You've got to do it multiple times. So why are you doing it in straight lines instead of just going ahead and making a circle? Because it it, uh, it gives you a better sense of how that's how that circle is constructed. I can do a circle, but this way I can come in here and then I can take off those corners and make adjustments to it as I go along. And I think I, I find I can do that better. What I'm doing is, uh, is if anybody was in bed, old, old math, you know, the old uh, math classes, you know, you can take and put tangent lines uh, around a circle. And that's kind of what I'm thinking about. Is it the best way? I don't know. It's the way I work. It's the way I was taught. Uh, it's just, and so I do the same thing if I'm doing figure. Um, I don't want to find the change of direction in planes as it goes around in the circle. Put this back in. We got this. Now you see my apples have gotten a little bit bigger since I'm not doing the stripes. I don't have to worry about that. And I'm still referring to this. Now the apple in the back is bigger than the apple in the front. Well, what does that say? Well, it says that it, you know, bigger apple. Yeah, bigger apple because normally it would be the other way around. The, the one in the back would be a little bit. Uh, now, now that I've drawn it in, now I'm going to do everything with a palette knife. I am not a real palette knife painter. I do it sometimes, but uh, it is not 
my forte. And tell you what I'm going to do. I do this. I learned how to paint palette knife from Camille Preswatic, who insists that her students learn it. Well, I, I think it's I think it's a very valuable thing to do, and I use it oftentimes at the when I get to the end because I can put a pure color on with that palette knife. Uh, what I try to do, I tend to paint uh, uh, kind of gray down paintings. That's why the Zorn palette's great because you're adding a little bit of black. But I, everything is kind of gray tone, almost like a like a, a mid tone. And then I can come in with a palette knife and I can put pure color on it. And it'll just you know just pops. What I'm going to do is I'm going to come in. I'm going to cheat a little bit because I. I can. I'm going to take, I took some mineral spirits. I just want to take that paint and I'm going to move it around. One of the things I found out with a palette knife, and I found this out years ago, I was doing what so many people do, is I was putting paint on so thin that I couldn't move it around. Uh, it was paint starved, what we call paint starved. Uh, so I, like, a, you know, if I was, I, I remember, I remember distinctly, I was doing a sky and I was trying to get that blue covering that area. So what I did was I thought, you know what, I'm just going to lay some, just lay some blue in there. And then you had some, now you've got some paint to work with. One of my, one of my mantras is you cannot paint without paint. I have uh, students that, that tend to be stingy on their paint. And I know it's expensive. And that's why I advocate using a little more inexpensive paint, particularly when you're learning. I was thinking the... In fact, I was thinking this morning, I've never painted with peanut butter, but I want to try it. All right. And it's not well, we'll, it. we'll have a show where you paint with peanut butter. Well, we'll do that next time. Uh, you know, we, the other thing you can paint with is coffee. You Well, you can, yes. It's, you want to, it's, you're really hard to it's like, it's like a value study with watercolor. Yeah, I mean, it's a watercolor thing. You're right. You're right. Now, I can lay this in. Let's see what happens here. So what I'm doing is by doing this, and this is a good exercise for me because I'm now having to say, okay, I know how to do it with a brush. How do I do it with a knife? And I can tell you right now, no matter what I do, I can do better. We could paint with, somebody and, says, we can paint with the frosting of a cake and then eat it later. Very good. Just don't mix your paints and your icing. Yeah. Uh, Anything is possible. So now I can come in here. I mean, now, you know, I'm doing this, last night. We I'm sorry. With that. Um, as I'm doing this, I'm thinking, you know what? I can do better. So I'm already thinking about painting number two. I want to get this one done so I can get on the next one. All right. Well, you don't have much time, so let's move forward. Well, they got the idea. We do have the idea. You want to do one more? Yeah, let's do one more. You got it. We'll lay them all out. I'm going to do this one the way I want to do it. How about that? Oh, okay. I'm just going to lay this one in. I'm not even going to draw this one in. I'm just going to do this. When I do plein air, I'm known as a fast, fairly fast painter. You will not find me out there with one subject for six hours. I just won't do it. Uh, I think I think there's there's a, I think there's a great value in getting out there and getting it done. And the only way you can do that, take that approach, is to be comfortable and familiar with your brushes and your paints and your colors. Now, would I find it, this circle like this in in real life? Yeah, probably somewhere. If not, at least I can take it and I can apply what I learned from this. And I paint, well, I'll be going down to Florida in March, I'm painting a lot of palm trees. They're not apples, but, you know, painting's painting. I'm learning my tools. That's what's, that's what I'm trying to, I guess if nothing else I'm learning, uh, what I'm trying to get across is learn your tools. You know, painting is only two, three things. It's a brush, it's paint, and it's a surface. That's all it is. And if you don't have those under your belt and don't understand those, um, throwing extra paint and color at it is not going to really help. Now I'm going to, how are we doing on time? You got about five minutes. Oh, goodness. I could do it yet another time. We'll put that in there. Well, uh, we learned last night you can do an awful lot in five minutes on the Super Bowl. Yeah, that's what I heard. I didn't watch it, but I heard it was pretty exciting. It was. I thought it was over. I thought, I thought for sure Kansas <laughs> City had lost. 
Well, you know, they're professionals and uh, things happen. Someone once said that uh, painting is a little bit like a football game. You know, you know, you know, you understand what's going to happen in a painting, just like you do understand what's going to happen in a football game, but you don't know what's going to happen at the end. And I think that's what's exciting about <laughs> painting. That's true. I don't know what's gonna, what this is going to do. All right. Oh, uh, you know, that's that's amazing how quickly you've gotten an impression. Do you read it as an apple? And you say, well, maybe no, it looks like a cherry. doesn't matter. The difference is made. It's representational. People will say, well, your work is so abstract. No, it's not. It's representational. It's expression. There's expression in it, yes. But uh, And I love this, this where it's it's gone outside the edge. It's almost yeah. like a um, uh, if you were taking tissue paper and laying it down on top of a drawing and doing a, a collage. Again, okay, let's through. put them all out. All right, let's do it. I'm going to get, uh, let's see, we'll leave that one there. Let's get this one. Ha, box myself in. So, Carrie Cornells asked, what's the equivalent of a palette knife and watercolor painting? You know, a I don't know. That's knife. a good question. That's a good question. I don't know. I don't Carrie, know. you can use a palette knife if you use um, watercolor that comes out of a tube. You can use a palette knife. Yeah, again, uh, Jamie Wyeth, you watch him paint. He paints uh, watercolors by taking this squirtment right out of the tube. Uh, I'm going to be down when I'm down in Texas in the next week with uh, going to be with the rattlesnake gang and they're all watercolors. I will ask that question. Yeah. Okay. Good. That one. This one. And I want one more. You can't see them. You can't see them. You I can will. You see the top two. You will. Oh. Get this one out of the way. I'm going to throw this one up too. This is the one I did. This was another one from another time. Hold on a second. Yeah. I'm getting seasick. Wow, look at that. Now you see what we can do. Now see what we have. The apples are this they're the one consistency throughout the whole thing. Now I can look at those and say, okay, what is working here? What is good? And then I can say, where are my where are my weaknesses? Because you want to find your weakness. That's what painting is about, I think. It's find your weaknesses. And then isolate those and then go find out how to make those better. Because you know what your strengths are. And uh, these are kind of fun. Actually, I kind of like that last one we did. Oh, it's got I such too. a to it. Yeah. So, okay, you need to come back on camera now so everybody can see your smiling I face. do that. Hey, this has been good fun. Right, let's see been. We... So our guest today is Lon Brower. And Lon is an incredible painter. And he has, uh, while he's getting his camera ready uh lon has a video with us there we go and uh it's pretty swell so i'll show it to you real quick the camera. Okay, there it is it's called abstract figure painting and he shows you how he does this kind of kind of thing in abstract and you can find that at painttube.tv where we have hundreds hundreds okay lon good job man thank you thank you okay uh, we put your website and all that all that Great. practical yes. information into the chat. If anybody needs it, finds it, uh, where are we going to see you next? Uh, you will see me. Well, I will be at Pace, uh, which I'm really looking forward to. I think I'm doing a uh, – I think they said that rather than doing a demo this this year, um, they're going to have me do a critique. That might be kind of fun. Oh, um, good. I'm looking All forward right. to that. Yeah. So when he says Pace, that means plan air convention and expo yes. Pace. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. And it's fun. I did it last year first time, and I'm really looking forward to it again because it's just – Yeah, so really give your perspective on it for people who don't know what it's like because when I say it, they don't believe me anyway. It's a convention, of course, but uh, you're with a whole lot of people who are on different levels. You've got people who are on top of their game, and you've got people who are just starting out, and the energy is just amazing. Uh, and I think that, you know, if nothing else, you come away from it just feeling like, All right, I want to go get, I just want to go get my paints and go to work. So what it's, would you uh, say to somebody who says, I am not worthy? Oh, by all means come because, uh, like I said, it's set up for everybody's level, uh, particularly even people who are just starting out. There's so much uh, uh, information given out to the young, to the young people, the uh, people who are just starting out and, and getting them, uh, you know, on the road to, uh, to paint. Yeah. So it's a good thing. So yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, Lon, thank you so much for being here today. You are a rock star. You taught us great lessons and uh, you are worthy. Well, thank you, Eric. I appreciate it. So thanks for having me on. It's been great. All right. Thanks again.
Our guest today is Lon Brower, and uh, we are so excited about seeing him on stage at the Plein Air Convention. So join us for that. And uh, join us for Plein Air Live coming up in March. I think you're going to enjoy that. Just go to pleinairlive.com or Plein Air Convention. If you can't go in person, go to Plein Air Live. We are not doing, for the first time, we are not doing an online version of the convention. We did that because of COVID. We're not doing that anymore. Uh, it's too hard to do. So we're going to just, we're going to do it live. Uh, it's going to be a massive number of people coming. The first time we're going east of the Mississippi. So I saw somebody in the chat and they said they live in Asheville. If you're not coming, you live in Asheville and you're not coming, there's something wrong with you, girl. Just saying. Hey, thanks for watching today. Uh, I'm Eric Rhodes and we're here every weekday. Make sure you subscribe. Just go to YouTube and look up Art School Live and hit the subscribe button. All right. I'm Eric Rhodes. Take care. Have a great day.